Hi, Bruce. Hi, Young. Thanks for inviting me to your uh, next wave. Yeah, thank you. No, that's really great. How are you doing? Quite good. Yeah. Just got done with a, a tasty lunch here at Playground. Oh, yeah, I love your lunch. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you got so many options from cold food to hot food to uh, vegan food to meat eaters and pizza it's, uh, and cookies. Yeah, it's, uh, it's always a great place to meet incredible people. I think, I think it's a great place to uh, kind of host startups and uh, entrepreneurs to hang out. Yeah? Absolutely. So uh, I have known Bruce for some time now, we're a friend. Uh, you, but let me just say the, your title, you're the you know, founding member uh, and partner at Playground Global. But more importantly, you've been my teacher in electric boiling at Santa Cruz Beach in your house. So I appreciate that and um, I, I really enjoyed doing it, too, especially during pandemic time when you need some break from uh, all the issues we had. Uh, now back to my interview. Uh, what I'd like to do is just give you a little background to what I heard about you, which is that uh, your careers from Apple uh, to uh, founding uh, Web TV, which eventually I think bought up by um, Microsoft. And then after several startups, you have joined and founded Playground Global. So tell our audience that are typically interested in story of entrepreneur, um, CEOs, as well as the, uh, someone that are trying to discover a new area of technology. I think it'll be really great if you can introduce your background, how you got to where you are, and your education, that type of things. Sure, absolutely. I think the, the short story is that I'm old, and I've been in the Valley for almost four decades now. And well, welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my first time on your podcast. Mm -hmm. But I came, to, I, I came to Silicon Valley to go to Stanford uh, to get my electrical engineering degree. Uh, I got a master's uh, at Stanford. Uh, and during that time, had some incredible opportunities to work at startups, uh, even while I was still at Stanford. Um, uh, one of the startups I worked at uh, as a freshman year, uh, as an intern, was a company called Microsoft. I think I heard of them. Yeah, yeah and they had 400 employees at the mm -hmm. time and were thinking about writing applications for personal computers. Uh, they already had an operating system. Uh, called DOS, um, and I had the privilege of being their entire testing team, team for their applications division, which at that time was working on a, a product called Microsoft Multi-Tool Word, um, which we all know of today as Microsoft Word. They, they lost the multi-tool part, um, and I'm sure you've all found bugs in that product that I didn't find when I was a, a college student. Uh, I apologize for that. Yeah. Um, but after, after uh, two interns at Microsoft um, and after my graduation from Stanford, I had the privilege of working at my, dr my dream startup, a company called Apple Computer. Um, uh, and once again, that's a, maybe a little different than the Apple you know of today because they don't call themselves Apple Computer anymore. Um, uh, back then, it was the early days of the Macintosh. Mm -hmm and they were just coming out with a color Macintosh. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of helping to introduce that Macintosh to the world right. um, with Steve Capps and some of the original employees there wow. um, at the Universal Studios with Jean-Louis Gasset. Wow. Uh, just as uh, you know, I started two weeks uh, before they launched that and all of the real engineers were working on finishing the product mm -hmm. and I got to write the software to help it introduce itself uh, to the world. So Bruce, it's very interesting because we are totally intertwined, right? So uh, in probably may, ways that we haven't even talked about. Um, because I went to school, I was at the time I was at MIT, by teaching executives how to use Apple II computer. Uh -huh. This is how I paid my tuition. And then I came to California, joined Intel, working on PC project with the microprocessors that are going with, guess what, with the DOS. Uh -huh. And so we were like in a uh, space converging at the same time. Probably that's why we're here. It probably is. I mean, I think that you know, there was so much ripe opportunity at that point in time. And I'm glad you brought up the Apple II. That was actually my first computer. Mm -hmm. um, and before, before Stanford, I used it to write software programs uh, as part of my summer jobs and uh, finally sold it um, uh, to buy my first car. Wow. Uh, I sold my Apple II, bought my Fiat, which then I drove to uh, California for my first trip here to start my, uh, start my time at, at Stanford. So, you know, people may not, may not recognize this Apple II days, right? 
When we are writing code and you know, people assume that you have this uh, app store, you can download and run it. Back then, I have to write assembly code, basic code, to run applications on Apple II computer. It wasn't like the canned package was there. I'm sure like when you're working on your projects, you probably have to do everything from scratch. Yes, and so at, at, at Apple, um, we only wrote an assembly language at that time. Um, because Compact. it had to go into the ROMs of the computers, yeah. uh, which people today are, why would you have ROMs? Because they're, they're always going to change, so right. why would you want them to be read-only? Mm -hmm. um, but that was the only approach back then. Um, and I'm glad you brought up the, you know, the, the App Store, because you know, my time at Apple was very special, because it was one of the few places in the world where you could write software mm -hmm. and give it away for free to everyone as part of the system software. Mm -hmm. um, and you think about today, like you, you know, getting an application from the App Store, you know, it happens billions of times a day all over the world. And as an engineer, you and I could write an application and post it up there and it, everybody could have access to it. Mm -hmm. But back when, you know, when we were young, uh, when we were starting our careers, software was not free like that. You had to buy software in a store in a box. Um, uh, and which is quite strange mm -hmm. when there wasn't an internet to, for distribution. Right. Um, uh, and so back then, the only free software uh, that I knew of came from Apple mm -hmm. uh, as system software. And you, to get the new version, you would have to take your floppy to the computer store and make a copy of it and take it home with you. Um, but the brilliance of that was as engineers at Apple, we could write you know, new capabilities, new features, mm -hmm. and give them away to the entire install base overnight and either hear you know cheers or complaints mm -hmm. about the software that we've written right. uh, for millions of people. Yes. I mean clearly we were very early stage of that 80s revolution that really enabled masses of people to enable compute power that was only for privilege of enterprise or government or some few selected people so it was a revolution just like we are going through now AI revolution where AI is going to be everywhere and I'm sure uh, I'd love to get your view of now where we are and where you guys are investing and where you, are, uh, where you see the trend in technologies. Absolutely. I mean, clearly AI is everywhere and it's just the beginning. Uh, my partner likes to say it's a, a revolution, uh, an overnight revolution that was 20 years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the promise is absolutely there. And in fact, when we founded Playground you know, almost nine years ago today, we knew that AI, at least we had this hypothesis, that AI was going to be the next revolution in compute. Mm -hmm. you know, we'd seen the you know, personal computers, we'd seen you know, the GUI interface, the web, rise of the web browser, we'd seen the mobile internet, um, each one of which was successfully larger and more impactful uh, in, their, in their penetration. And you know, our belief was that AI in the cloud was going to be the next big revolution. Um, but we couldn't predict when it was going to happen and how it was going to happen. Um, but we knew that it was underway. And in doing that, at Playground, we wanted to create the venture capital firm that we wish existed when we were entrepreneurs. And so all of the general partners at Playground, all of the founders at Playground are engineers by training, but entrepreneurs by experience. We've all raised money um, and sometimes you know, from other venture capitalists and sometimes we enjoyed that and sometimes not so much. Mm -hmm. um, but what we learned was you know, pretty much VCs are distracted by all the investments they need to make um, uh, and in managing all that money mm -hmm. and don't get enough time to spend with their entrepreneurs and help them on that journey. I mean, all VCs want to do that, and all VCs say that they're more than just money, because if they were just money, it wouldn't be very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're doing at Playground, you know, we believe that we've built you know, a, a bespoke solution that really can take a technical founder mm -hmm. and wrap all the capabilities around them in order to help them deliver their world-changing solution to the market. So uh, maybe some more background on the, where we are, right? We are in the uh, playground in Palo Alto, where I also hang out with you guys and your startups. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the, how many startups are here and how do you uh, see the you know, selection process of coming, companies coming in and uh, what kind of people are hanging out here? Yeah, absolutely. So, we have the privilege of having a 70,000 square foot warehouse in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that there are any 
you know, warehouses to speak of left in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a bit of a fixer upper and a passion project for us to create the space, you know, and the environment where we could, you know, enable the ecosystem where deep tech founders could come and meet other deep tech founders mm -hmm. and some of the smartest people in Silicon Valley come hang out just for the food. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, thank you, Young. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, have conversations that, you know, really can impact where the world ends right. uh, and where we can take it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, today we have about 15 startups in the building. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are investments of Playground. Not all of them, some of them are too early for us mm -hmm. um, or really just some of the smartest people we've ever met. Mm -hmm. And we want to have them all in the same building all having breakfast, lunch, and dinner together and sharing their ideas mm -hmm. uh, and cross-pollinating what's possible. Right. It's a great, I mean, I can vouch for it because I spent time with you and time with your partners, time with the startup CEOs, and you just, it's that things that we miss during pandemic, right? Because we can really run into each other without even planning or scheduling, which is sometimes the best way to... It's where I learn the most and where I have the most fun. Right. Is, you know, you know, running into somebody at breakfast, asking them what they're up to, and learning about the crazy ideas that have come true since the last time we've talked. What are some of the craziest ideas that uh, you are incubating out here? You know, so many. I know one that, uh, that you've been uh, involved in because of your experience around semiconductors, mm -hmm. uh, a company called x -Lite, mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. is making the future of extreme UV light sources mm -hmm. uh, to continue to push forward the boundaries of what's possible in mm -hmm. lithography for next generation compute. Yeah, I just talked with uh, Eric uh, just about an hour ago. Uh, just was that at lunch or after lunch? Uh, it's a before lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in, amazing. I introduced him to someone from Samsung because I thought they could have more conversation because the limitation in shrinking chip is the light source. Yeah. And the light source is becoming so expensive and so hard to navigate. Finding a new way that can be able to reduce overall cost and the throughput will have a dramatic impact on how you can build a chip. Yeah, I mean, you know, for, it's a great example of where it's, you know, technology is really the only path to move the, this industry forward. Mm -hmm. And we had the privilege of, of meeting Eric and his team early on and understanding their unique backgrounds to be able to make this happen. And it's similar to many of our companies where this is essentially the founder's life's work the culmination of this technology and taking it to market is something that they've spent a decade, you know, really being the, the world's expert on. Great. I'm so glad that we, we can hang out together and talk about, you know, we can talk about many other topics too. We have common hobbies and uh, friends, but uh, it is a part of a Silicon Valley lifestyle in a way, right? It's, uh, it's kind of interesting how ideas can generate and we can support each other. And to me, in the area of deep tech, there is no competition. It's about collaboration, right? So mainly because building a deep tech company, I think takes a very long time. Yep. Cannot do it alone. So we are always looking for partner. And uh, because it's very, it's very long, lonely process otherwise, because it takes so long and it takes so much courage and so much a uh, bravery to drive something dramatic and have a huge impact on the way we live. So, so I think some of the uh, companies that you guys are working on is like that. So maybe you can talk about a little bit of your, some of the things that you are pushing that is like the category, you know, and uh, what does it take to have enough courage to drive that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that for us, it's the it's a you know it's about the technology and it's about the team and then it's about the impact that it can make in the world, um, and we see you know the fortunate thing is that there's so much opportunity. Um, I mean the world has so many needs, whether it's climate, you know, whether it's sustainability, you know, whether it's you know continuing to drive the cost of compute down so that we can continue to innovate. Um, you know, one of my favorite investments uh, was one we did very early on uh, was a company called Cyquantum. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that came to us actually through another VC, mm -hmm. uh, which isn't uncommon. Yeah. Uh, I think my partner Lipwin invested in that company. He did, yeah. and and they have it. They have an incredible cap table mm -hmm. because you know they were the first ones to realize that you know a useful quantum computer, you know, it requires at least a million qubits. Yes. And everybody else in the world was like, hey, I've got 57. I'll have you know 72 next year. Won't that be great? Mm -hmm. 
And they came to us as three technical founders that spent a decade in the labs proving out uh, their technologies and came to us and said, look, all of these qubits are noisy. Mm -hmm. They're all physical qubits that are, can't be used just like a logical qubit, exactly. right? Because they're not error corrected. They're not yeah. redundant. Mm -hmm. um, and, so, and so, you know, you can't have a, a, a computer where when you run the program, you get one answer, you run it again, you get a different answer, mm -hmm. right? That's just not going to be acceptable. It sounds like ChatGPT right it now. It does. <laughs> well, the, the, the hallucination is, mm -hmm. is a feature, yeah. not a bug. Yeah, right. um, exactly. But uh, they came to us and look, a million qubits is the baseline minimum. Mm -hmm. Because with a million physical qubits, we can make a useful number of logical qubits mm -hmm. that are completely resilient, error corrected, and redundant, mm -hmm. so that every time you run the program using the power of quantum computing, you always get the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that was impressive to us that they realized they were looking that far ahead mm -hmm. and knew that, OK, if in order to make a million qubits, we need to start with our base qubit with something that's manufacturable. Mm -hmm. Um, and so had focused on photons mm -hmm. as the basis for their, for their, their qubits mm -hmm. and silicon photonics right. um, and CMOS mm -hmm. as their manufacturing process. So, you know, when you have, you know, three incredible technical founders that say, look, we're going to leverage the trillions of dollars that have been spent on, on you know, commercially manufacturing semiconductors right. and use that as the platform to build our quantum computer, mm -hmm. um, we were willing to take a, a very you know, early bet there. Yeah, which early is, and which in a way long bet too. Well, yes and no. So for example, they had a roadmap mm -hmm. at the earliest days have said, look, here's the five things we have to solve mm -hmm. in order to get to the answer. Mm -hmm. And here's how we're going to solve each one one step at a time. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we love in a technical founder. Where you know it, it, the difference between uh, you know an engineered solution and a science project, yeah. right? A science project is just give me an infinite amount of money and someday I'll be done. Exactly. Um, right. Some of that today is nuclear fusion is somewhat in that bucket, mm -hmm. right? I won't have anything until I'm done, mm -hmm. and I need a lot, a lot, a lot of money and time. Right. Um, for us, that's not a great venture uh, investment. Yeah. Exactly. Um, uh, there are some fusion tech, we've looked at a lot of fusion technology, we think there are some that could change the game and change that equation, you know, mm -hmm. so that it's not just an infinite amount of money before we can prove this is a better approach, this is a practical approach. Mm -hmm. But with quantum computing, uh, the PsyQuantum team was very crisp and very clear and said, look, you know, the five things that are missing mm -hmm. uh, that we know how to solve and we're going to solve one by one are these. Right. And so it's actually a, a reasonably small amount of money mm -hmm. and a reasonable small amount of time before they hit their first milestone and proved mm -hmm. that their hypothesis was correct and they were on the right trajectory. Right. So when do you expect the quantum compute will be, let's say, commercially feasible? Well, so it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not many people noticed, but uh, last month PsyQuantum announced a, an agreement with Slack and the Department of Energy mm -hmm. over here at Stanford mm -hmm. to have access to their cryo plant mm -hmm. um, uh, for cooling. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, why does a startup need access to a commercial scale cryo plant? Mm -hmm. um, certainly not for testing, um, uh, but actually yeah. for building mm -hmm. a computer. Mm -hmm. And so now we know where it's going to be, and now the question is when. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm not at liberty to say, you know, the exact you date, precise, but yeah. within a few years, mm -hmm. uh, their goal is to have the first practical quantum computer uh, up and running. That would be breakthrough. When do you expect they will can be able to do one million? No, it will be a million. That's their first one. So that would be really impressive. Yes, and yes. so you know, it's really a matter of engineering now. It's a matter of pouring concrete and getting cooling and building racks and delivering on their solution. Right. Uh, they have a great partnership with Global Foundries, mm -hmm. um, you know, as their as their you know silicon fab, exactly. and they have been you know producing uh, you know uh, test samples with them uh, for many years now. So for those of you in the audience may not understand quantum compute, just the benefit of a quantum compute really is about being able to change the traditional uh, von Neumann compute architecture to an architecture where the binary numbers, so one and zero based architecture, become now many, 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 many bits. So you can be able to run things concurrently much faster than what we can today. So for instance, linear equations, for instance. When you are trying to solve many, many equations simultaneously, this could be very beneficial. Application looks like drug discovery. When you have many molecules and you want to figure out what's the optimum combination, it takes a long compute cycle today in traditional compute. Quantum compute should be able to solve that. If you can get a million bit, 
in a few years, that could be a huge game changer. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the one thing I'm super proud about with Cyquantum is um, a year ago, they announced uh, and launched an initiative called, called Catalyst, uh, excuse me, called Climate mm -hmm. with a Q. Oh. Um, and what they've done is they've, they've basically set aside a percentage of their quantum computing capabilities mm -hmm. as they build out their facility, mm -hmm. uh, purely to be focused on the climate challenge. Um, and they're looking for partners in that, in, you know, in that endeavor mm -hmm. around this, this, this climate with a Q, uh, mm -hmm. dot org. Um, and so fantastically, because just like you said, uh, you know, things in chemistry, things in biology, things in material science mm -hmm. lend themselves very, very well to this new approach mm -hmm. where you're searching a, a very large space for the particular characteristics you're looking exactly. for. So, you know, designing a new material versus discovering a new material. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, let's go into a bit of, uh, as you get older, health matters a lot. And the health drives 20% of our GDP. And I think it will continue to increase, not going down. The whole world is actually aging, except Africa. So given the demographic and given the tremendous challenges, we are all trying to figure out uh, what I call biology 2.0. How do we apply technology to impact our lives better. And I know you're also working in this area. So tell us a little bit about anything that are exciting in this space that uh, you think is really going to make the difference. I mean, there's so many exciting opportunities in the engineered biology space. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, whether it's biology 2.0, I mean, w we often describe it as the industrial revolution hasn't made it, you know, to biology yet or to healthcare. And, uh, you know, we, we've been focused very much uh, in the therapeutic space, mm -hmm. um, because as I said, you know, to date, we've most therapies, you know, most drugs um, uh, are discovered, mm -hmm. right? Aspirin is the, you know, from the bark of a tree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, to that degree, all these things exist in nature and we're trying to harness them for our, our good. Right. Um, but there's so many things that may either don't exist in nature or we haven't found and understood mm -hmm that with things like quantum computing, uh, we can design and create. Mm -hmm. um, and more interestingly, we can also take some of our other engineering disciplines that we're you know, so advanced in, you know, robotics and automation and AI, uh, silicon photonics and sensing technologies, mm -hmm. and applying those to the drug, drug discovery pipeline right. uh, in different therapeutic uh, areas. Mm -hmm. And so we've been doing more and more of that type of investment. Typically, it looks like uh, PhD students coming out of a, uh, out of a uh, renowned lab mm -hmm. uh, with a theory of a new approach, a new modality to solving disease. Yeah. Um, and so we have one of those uh, in a company called Strand mm -hmm. uh, that is using mRNA technology mm -hmm. uh, to deliver uh, very, very targeted therapies. Mm -hmm. uh, so not like vaccines, which yeah. mRNA, mRNA is very famous for these days. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, you know, the, ch the traditional challenges with mRNA is that it goes all throughout the all throughout the body, right. um, which is great if you're ch chasing a virus mm -hmm. because it's everywhere in your body. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to target cancer yeah. uh, using mRNA, having it go all throughout your body and end up in your spleen and your liver and your brain, mm -hmm. if that's not where the cancer is, isn't helpful, mm -hmm. and lowers the the tox it raises the toxic toxicology the toxic levels mm -hmm. of those drugs, mm -hmm. uh, and so you can't deploy enough right. to the target. So the analogy to carpet bombing versus precision bombing. Exactly. And so what Strand does is they're able to create mRNA that is self-replicating, that can live on in your body so you don't have to worry about the dosage, but it can target specific tissues with specific proteins under specific circumstances. And the thing we were, fell in love with was, and you'll like this, is it's, it's, it's like writing microcode uh, or Verilog uh, equations. You can actually write software and deliver it as biology mm -hmm. uh, that operates in your body looking for the right time to deploy the therapy. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, software-defined body. Exactly, <laughs> so software-defined therapies, yes. It's inc incredible, I'd love to get introduced to the company later on. What is your view of safety of AI? Uh, particularly, there's a lot of debate whether we need a referee or not. And there is a big conference in London just last week where I think Elon Musk was there talking with the Prime Minister of the UK talking about the safety subject. He believes, he thinks that we, Musk thinks that we should have a referee because, you know, advancement is happening very quickly and he's concerned that uh, we might 
we have to think about the public safety as we things are evolving. What is your view on that? I mean, I think that it's, it's very early in the AI industry and there's a lot of innovation going on. I think we need to be careful, you know, not to disadvantage the startups uh, in that world um, that maybe aren't in a position to uh, engage with lots of governmental bodies, mm -hmm. um, you know, to the favor of some of the large, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some of the larger tech companies. But I also think that, you know, AI is a tool. It's like, it's like saying software is going to eat the world. Mm -hmm. We need to regulate software. Um, I, I think that we're in a position and we should focus on regulating the industries and the products and the applications uh, where they're deployed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, self-driving cars. Self-driving cars have AI in them. Absolutely. Should, we, should we regulate that AI as AI or should we regulate it as a car mm -hmm. that has to, man, you know, has to manage all the rules of the road, all of the state requirements? Mm -hmm. um, or the jobs that they're, you know, that they're deployed as. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know how you regulate you know, an automatic pilot uh, using AI. I think we should have them, mm -hmm. but I don't think you regulate that devoid from the fact that it's in an airplane. Um, so what you're saying is it's not about the technology, it's about the usage, it's about application, and it's about safety implication of the application Absolutely. that are imposing in, whether it's a drug discovery to autonomous driving, or, uh, or autonomous flying, all those type of things. Yeah, I mean, if AI you know, creates a drug, mm -hmm. the safety protocol should be we have to run it through all the trials we would, we would run through even if AI didn't create that drug. Yeah, including traceability. Absolutely, from, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So what is your view of open source? Because I think that open source has been a beneficiary of a advancement in many ways, but there is a discussion and debate at this point because of open, it also brings this uh, decoupled geographic perspective. It may give an advantage to a party that you may not want to give their advantage, or because of it's open, maybe there are some agents could be injected from bad actors, from North Korea or whatever, and this is a very concerning the debate. So the open source was kind of a universal gospel of attack for, I don't know, last 40 years, I have a feeling it's in debate again, and I'd love to get your perspective on it. Yeah, I think, I think open source is, is, is a force for good. Um, I think you know, knowledge wants to be free, and open source is, is an approach to that. I don't think that you have to be in Silicon, you know, all the smart people in the world aren't in Silicon Valley, and you know, sharing uh, you know, baseline technologies. I, I see it more as an academic uh, endeavor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, you know, Teaching computer science um, doesn't necessarily have to happen in a university. It should happen on the internet, and it sh everybody should have access to that. And so seeing good practices, seeing state-of-the-art uh, technologies, being able to share that um, uh, you know, broadly uh, for people who want to do that. I don't think everything should be forced to be open source. Um, but if I believe I've invented a better algorithm for something, and I want to give it away as open source and have everybody build on top of that, I think that's I think that's good for society. Um, in terms of people being able to, you know, co-opt it uh, for nefarious purposes, I mean, I think that it, it goes both ways, right? Um, you know, closed source can be co-opted as well, um, either through uh, you know bad agents um, okay. that have, or you know, on purpose yeah. uh, or yeah. on neglect. Right. Um, and I think that. Uh, you know, I don't think closed source makes it safer in that respect. You can have flaws in the code. You can have, you know, you can have, um, you know, bugs implanted in it by bad actors. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen this with the solar winds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if it's open source, at least everybody can inspect it and see what's in it. And I think shining light and transparency will get us closer to where we want to be than keeping it behind closed doors and, and assuming that governments or big tech are going to take care of us right. uh, in our best interest. So the, I think this is going to be an interesting time because of the given the sensitivity around technology race that we are on. I think that this is why I think people are questioning this topic. But one of the things that really made it more dramatic, I think, lately has been the large language model, right? Which made ChatGPT possible. OpenAI has shown some of great examples of applications. And of course, the data matters a lot, because that's how you train and can have a bias. 
And then this is also source of potential issues. There's a question around proprietary model versus the uh, open model and how is it going to evolve over time. So I think the sensitivity is much higher, mainly because we're dealing with data security, data breach, and data privacy issues, and kind of data that could come in. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I also think there's an element of, you know, big tech doesn't have the trust of society or politicians that it did right. uh, maybe a decade ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there's also, you know, social media and the polarization of information uh, has also driven, you know, who, you know, who do you trust? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's a lot more concern around, you know, pinch points and bottlenecks in technology and in information. Mm -hmm. um, and the ability to inject, um, you know, fake news right. into, into the system. Yes, it's a much more rapidly changing, complex time. I have a last question for you. Uh, obviously, we don't have a good answer for all these questions other than it's a time we are in, time where these things are happening very quickly and I think we'll continue to have some good debates, and debates are good to uh, advance in our thinking and having the proper policies that can be at the balance between innovation and regulation in check and balance, Safety, yep. exactly. So let's, uh, let me ask you the last question, that is, you know, you've been working with many entrepreneurs out here, particularly those that want to make the difference and pay using innovation and using deep tech as a way to uh, promote, which I'm 100% behind up. What are some of your messages to um, entrepreneurs that want to be? I mean, I think that, you know, first off, it's, as you said earlier, deep tech and entrepreneur startups are, are a long journey and a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so I think first off, I would tell entrepreneurs, make sure you're following your passion and that this is really the thing that is important to you because it's gonna take longer than you want and it's gonna be harder than you want. And so make sure that it's gonna make the impact that you're here to deliver as you know, part of that journey. I think that's, that is absolutely right. It is a- um, Enjoy it as you yeah, go because yeah. the journey is the reward. Exactly. <laughs> And, and there's so many things to overcome. I, I think that uh, I know one thing that I know you are also working is you cannot do, do it alone, right? So partnership and ecosystem building is always a very key part of it. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, you know, we find uh, all the time that it's, you know, it takes a village yes. and it's about the team, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, although you may believe you can do it by yourself, and I hope you do, mm -hmm because that's the way most, some of the most important things happen because it takes somebody with, you know, a, uh, you know, a, un, un, uh, you know, un, un, unbearable ability to just make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, but find partners in, in the adventure right. um, uh, because even if you could do it all yourself, you want, you want others along for the, for the journey. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, the, the variability of perspective um, the diversity of perspective can make a really big impact in success mm -hmm. because if you can only see it from one way, you keep running into that wall, having a partner or, or an advisor or some other people in the, in the team mm -hmm. can let you know that you can go around that wall and here's how you do it. Right. You don't have to keep hitting it head on. Yeah. Together, you can overcome maybe better. So let's talk a little, bit, a little bit about other areas that I think you guys are also very uh, much involved, robotics. And you know, a lot of people think about robotics being around very long time, uh, but I think the question around useful robots, and of course, even the cars now, I look at robots, right? In a way, uh, it's an, you know, it may not be fully autonomous yet, but you know, much of features of uh, sensing, being able to pass binding, and then activating the uh, motors and others, all part of uh, what robots do. So tell us about what, how, what is your view of robots and where do you think we are? Yeah, so we spend a lot of time in robotics and automation. Uh, and now as AI starts to wrap around those hardware capabilities and make them even more powerful, uh, we are quite busy. So we have uh, many investments in that space. Uh, they span many different uh, industries mm -hmm. um, because we really focus on the technologies and then you know what industries then are they applicable to to and so you know obviously we all came out of the pandemic realizing that we had challenges in our supply chains mm -hmm. um, and in logistics and even a particular challenge to hire the labor that's needed in warehouses 
Uh, and so we have a, a fantastic company called Agility Robotics uh, out of Oregon, mm -hmm. um, uh, which was founded by a, a, a PhD. Two legged robots. A, bi a bipedal robot mm -hmm. uh, that was founded by a, a PhD, actually two PhDs out of Car Carnegie Mellon University. Mm -hmm. um, and the CTO founder created the robotics lab at Oregon State University. Uh, used a lot of, of DARPA money uh, mm -hmm. to prove out the technology, mm -hmm. uh, trained a lot of PhD students. Uh, and then left Oregon State University, took the technology and its PhD students with him and founded uh, Agility Robotics. And now they're spending a lot of time uh, in warehouses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Amazon just announced uh, last month that uh, they're working with them directly on uh, solving some of their labor challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that when you treat employees like robots, mm -hmm. they quit their jobs. <laughs> um, right? When you ask them yeah. just to do you know, this one thing right. repeatedly right. Um, all day long, mm -hmm. It's not very. Uh, it's, not it's it's not it, it, it creates repetitive stress, yes. uh, but it also is just not very enriching or or enjoyable. Right. Um, and so they have you know, so a lot of the folks in logistics supply chain today have trouble hiring uh, entry level workers mm -hmm. uh, in some of these most simple tasks where they're essentially connecting different islands of automation. Mm -hmm. Often in these types of warehouses today, uh, or even manufacturing facilities today, there's an automated process that creates an intermediate product, and someone has to take it and insert it into the next automated process that either packages it or finishes it or paints it right. uh, because these islands are not connected. No. And we've, we've, used, we've grown up using humans to connect those two islands together. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, as that scales up to very high volumes, you know, where you're not mixing that job with three other jobs, it gets really boring. Exactly. Um, and so Agility Robots is perfect for those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, and they are on path uh, to come to market early next year. In fact, they just announced their, uh, their Salem manufacturing plant. They call it the Robo Factory wow. or the Robo Fab, mm -hmm. uh, where they can build up to 10,000 robots um, big, uh, per capacity. year in an Oregon. Uh, mm -hmm. No one's ever shipped more than a thousand robots, yeah. uh, uh, certainly not by pedal. Mm -hmm. um, sure. uh, and uh, 10,000 robots is like building 10,000 smart cars to right. some degree. I mean, it's a, it's a heavy lifting operation, but they have an incredible team mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Wow. Looking forward to a visiting factory someday with yeah. you. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, we do a lot of other things in robotics and automation, uh, things that you might not recognize as robots because they don't look like people. Mm -hmm. um, a company called Farmwise uh, that does autonomous weeding of, of, uh, of vegetables mm -hmm. in, in, uh, right. in Salinas Valley. Yeah. Um, and another, oper another situation where it's very hard to get labor, mm -hmm. uh, to actually take a hoe and go out and weed right. Uh, right. lettuce yeah. or, or oh, celery. Or um, and you know, it's a great opportunity to take advantage of computer vision. Um, and the AI analysis of being able to see every plant and understanding, you know, what each plant needs mm -hmm. and farm on a plant by plant basis instead of a field by field basis. Mm -hmm. So that allows them to be able to use fewer inputs, less mm -hmm. fertilizer, mm -hmm. uh, less pesticide, mm -hmm. but actually get more yield uh, right. from the same land. Right. And save the bags as well, and especially labor perspective. Yeah. yeah, it's great. So I think there's some great examples of technologies that are impacting our lives. And in a way, I think all we are, what we're trying to do is using deep tech to enable the advancement of the uh, human lives. Uh, this is actually a, an example of one of our company's companies. So are you flying, Bruce? Actually, um, uh, this company is flying. Um, many of our companies are flying. We'll talk about that okay. today. But uh, they had their first flight in March of their hydrogen-powered airplane. Wow. And uh, wow. they have flown it many times since then. Mm -hmm. So having, you know, having to choose between sustainability yeah. and economics, mm -hmm. it's always a hard choice, especially right. for companies running a business. You don't want to have those choices. Um, by, make making, by using technology to make yeah. it so you don't have to make a choice, right. so that you can actually fly sustainably, mm -hmm. but you know, at, at least the same cost or cheaper mm -hmm. uh, than fossil fuels, mm -hmm. uh, uh, will allow this to really take off, yeah. literally. Well, I can see the positive angle, which is a clearly non pollutive and abundance of hydrogen that we have, what's the downside? You know, there really is no downside. The downside is we have to move from the extractive technologies we've been using, mm -hmm. um, uh, which are, you know, prevalent and cheap, mm -hmm. uh, and move to, you know, a new set of technologies that don't involve 
digging holes in the ground right. and destroying the planet um, and something that's completely sustainable right, right. you burn hydrogen and it turns into water yeah. I mean when this plane flew so this is you know this plane already exists is the ATR 72 um, and it runs on kerosene traditionally mm -hmm. uh, what universal hydrogen has done is replace the kerosene engines with electric motors mm -hmm. and hydrogen fuel cells mm -hmm. uh, and then they are delivering the hydrogen to the airport as cargo mm -hmm. So that any airport can load that onto the plane, they have bag they have all the team people and equipment they need mm -hmm. to load that onto the plane. Then this plane can now fly sustainably, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, they proved in their first flight because it's a manned flight uh, with their test pilot. Uh, they proved that when you turn off the kerosene engine and you run just on the electric motor, it's a lot smoother and quieter. Mm -hmm. And customers are going to prefer that, just like they prefer driving an electric car versus a diesel, right. uh, you know, a diesel truck. Less smelly, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I wish you all the best on this one. And then the front corner of the building here, uh, this 70,000 square foot warehouse, the front corner is where we have our team of 45 people uh, who not only help find our investments and help de-risk the technology, we do our own technical diligence, uh, but they also help them build out their companies, build out their team, build out their operations, uh, and, and help them de-risk their products. Supporting the staff. Mm -hmm. This, uh... Some ring to it. Yeah, this, yeah. this uh, incredibly large soup bowl. Uh, no, actually, uh, this is the beginning of a fuel tank. Uh, that was 3D metal printed okay. um, a long time ago by this company called Relativity Space. Mm -hmm. And when Relativity Space came to us, there were 13 people mm -hmm. um, and wanted us to lead uh, their Series A. And they knew that we were experts in additive manufacturing. Uh, they wanted, their goal was to be able to 3D print a rocket, mm -hmm. um, ideally within a week or two, mm -hmm. and then be able to launch it in the next week or two. Wow. And, you know, when we invested, as I said, they were 13 people. Um, uh, since then, they've raised more than a billion dollars. And here they are in, Mar are in March, mm -hmm. launching from their pad at Cape Canaveral, their first rocket. First startup ever to get to space on their first launch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, also the first one in... The and this is one of those that went in... Well, so this is the beginning of a fuel tank, okay. right? So not only do they yeah. can print the fuel tank, they yeah. can print the fairings, the fuselage. 85% mm -hmm. of the dry mass of the rocket, mm -hmm. they can print with a spool of aluminum mm -hmm. and electricity. Wow. Um, each one has to be attached. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure the attachment wasn't too tight, too loose, because it's a safety issue. Right. Being able to print everything as one piece means you don't have all those attachments to test and fix mm -hmm. and change mm -hmm. and allows them to basically build, too, right? build yeah. hardware at the mm -hmm. speed of software, right? right? Because mm -hmm. since there's no tooling in the manufacturing process, right. if the next rocket needs to be a foot larger in diameter, that's just a software parameter. Mm -hmm. If the fuel tanks need to be larger because they want to go higher, mm -hmm. that's just a software parameter. Yeah. Um, and so they're able to iterate, mm -hmm. you know, an order of magnitude faster than a traditional uh, space technology company. Wow. Makes sense for especially the custom type of applications where you need few things in a uh, place where you can all automate or put it all together. Absolutely. And so yeah. they've launched their first rocket, as, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're off building the larger version that will also be reusable. Wow. Reusable. That will be competing with some of the well known projects out there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you and I know too well, this is the heart of Playground, oh, the, yeah. the cafeteria. Yeah, right, exactly. um, and this is the superpower of all of our startups that live here, mm -hmm. which is they can invite potential employees over to their cafeteria and treat them to a wonderful gourmet meal. I need to do that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and use that to open the conversation of, why don't you want to work here with us mm -hmm. and help us change the world? But since m many of our companies have physical products that have some tether to the physical world, yes. uh, we have a prototyping shop uh, where we can help them rapidly iterate on design. So you can share the equipment, share the tools, Absolutely. instead of having your own expense. Yes, and so we have all the capabilities, and then they just have to have the dream of what they want to do with them, right. and we have staff to help them ex execute sense. on those plans. Yeah, reuse. Oh, you got some work here. And one of the, yeah, one of the most fun things uh, about having a, uh, a machine shop, um, uh, 
not only can we do our own first principle science experiments mm -hmm. um, and understand the state of the art in things like electrochemical ammonia production, mm -hmm. um, or we could test out the latest capabilities in 3D metal printing. Uh, and so, you know, this is a titanium uh, print out of a, uh, a laser bed fusion technology company mm -hmm. um, that was our first public company, a company called Bello 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I like to joke that, uh, you know, this is the beginnings of Lady Gaga's dress for the next <laughs> Academy Awards uh, that can be 3D metal printed mm -hmm. uh, out of titanium. And the cool thing about titanium, of course, is that it bounces. Whoa. Um, mm -hmm. And it's musical. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, Bruce, joining this uh, Next Wave speaker series with me. Uh, it's very insightful. And I know you're going to show some more of the uh, demos and things that you do in Playground, which is what you do, collection of many interesting people, projects. And uh, we wish you continuing to push for the envelope of innovation that can make a big impact. Thanks for inviting me, and you know this is not something I do very often, so I appreciate you uh, having the conversation with me and also uh, putting up with my training uh, of your e-foiling uh, in the shark-infested waters of uh, the Monterey Bay. I'm still survived and kicking, so it's good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot.